Let me start with a little prehistorical context. In a prehistoric time, a small group left the camp to forage for food. They wandered far from the camp, and they came across this ravine. And they were about to head down steep one side and up the other when one of them noticed a tree that had fallen laying on the ground. And they, they lifted up that tree, stood it up on end, tilted a little bit, and leaned it so it fell, and it crossed the ravine. It was the first bridge. They, they went across the bridge, carefully keeping their balance. And one of them grabbed a branch that broke off of the tree and, and kept it as a walking stick. And as they continued on, the others saw this walking stick. And they picked up branches. And they all had walking sticks. Finally, they, they came to a field of berries. And they started picking the berries and filling their pouches. And suddenly, one of them was attacked by a bear. And they started to run away. And then one of them grabbed his stick and, and hit the bear. And they all came with their sticks. And they were going to hit the bear. And the bear ran away. And they saved their friend. It was time to head back. And they realized they, they weren't sure which was the way home. And one of them climbed this tall tree and looked out in the distance and pointed the way. And so when they finally got home, they so wanted to tell this story that they invented language. Now, who is to say if that's the way it happened? But we often say that what distinguishes humans from other animals is that we have language. And I wonder if, even more fundamentally, it's that we tell stories. Um, my father was a storyteller. And uh, storytelling is easy. But then again, my mother was not a storyteller. And while it's easy to tell a story, it's hard to tell a hug. Well, I was four years old, just a little guy. And my mother asked me, Sandy, I have to go shopping. Would you like to stay home, or do you want to come shopping with me? And I, I hate shopping. I still hate shopping. It gives me a headache. I said, Mommy, I'll stay home. And so she went off to do her shopping. And moments later, I wanted my mommy. And so I, uh, I thought maybe she'd come and get me. I, I got my wool coat on, this full-length wool coat that I hated. It was this itchy wool. And I buttoned it up all the way to the top. And I hated that collar rubbing on my neck. And, I even put the hat on, and it had these ear flaps. And I tied them underneath my chin with this itchy wool string. I hated that hat more than I hated the coat. And I stood there in the middle of the living room floor waiting for my mommy. When finally she came in the front door, she, she saw me there, and she knew exactly what happened. She put down her packages. She came, and she swept me up in her arms. And I was crying, and she was crying, and she was sobbing. And she was a large woman. And when she sobbed and shook, you really knew it. And finally, she regained her composure, and I regained my composure. And we went about our little boy and mommy ways. When I was 12 years old, my Boy Scout troop went to summer camp. And my mother was sure that I would get homesick. But that first week went by. I didn't think of home once until Parents' Day came. Now, our camp was on a hillside. And at the top of the hill was this roadway. That's where the parents would be coming in. and then. There was a trail that led down the hillside, and there was a level area. That's where we had our flagpole and our campfire circle and the scoutmaster's cabin. And then the land continued down a slope. And at the bottom, that's where all the boys' lean-tos were. And that's where we were, cleaning up our bunks, waiting for the parents to show up. And I'm, I'm pulling the leaves out of my sleeping bag when I hear from the top of this hillside this voice. Showman! And there I could see my mother, a large woman, bounding down the hillside. And so I started up from the lean-tos. And we met right there in the middle of the camp in that level campfire circle where everybody could see us. And she put her arms around me. And she was crying. And she was sobbing. And I'm putting my arms around her. I wasn't going to 
push her away or show that I was embarrassed. I, I was tolerant. And we stood there in the middle of the campfire circle with everybody watching, I'm sure, until my mother regained her composure and then we went about our Boy Scout camp parent day things. I was 17 when I went off to college. And I didn't get home to visit very often. But when I did, I would come in that front door and my mother would be right there waiting for me and she would put her arms around me and she would hug me and she would start crying and her whole body would shake. I would put my arms around her and I was understanding. And then after she regained her composure, we would go about doing our young adult son and, and mother things. And it was the same way every time I came home. Uh, it was like a ritual, but it, it was the real thing each and every time. When I was 29, I was about to get married. My wife and I were going to get married on Labor Day, and here it was the early summer. We had bought this house, and we were going to get married in the house. And we were painting and repairing and furnishing, uh, not just to get the house in shape, but to get it in shape for the wedding. It was uh, early in the summer. It was in July when my sister Selma called. My mother hadn't been feeling very well. She'd been to the doctor several times, same doctor she had seen for decades. But he wasn't there. He was on vacation. And so she saw some younger doctor. And he was unfamiliar with her case. He was a new doctor in the practice. He looked through her health history, and he gave her an examination. And he ordered some tests. And my sister had just come back from visiting the doctor to hear his report. He said, your mother has colon cancer. And it's gone into her kidneys and her liver. And the prospects are not good. Well, my sister asked him, Doctor, is, is she, is she going to be able to make it to my brother's wedding, my little brother, the youngest of the family, the only boy? Is she going to make it to his wedding? He said, when is the wedding? My sister Selma said, it's in September. And, and he said, early September or late? Well, my mother did make it to the wedding that Labor Day. I can still picture her sitting on the couch in front of the living room windows, that new couch that we would bought. I can see her there and all the people in our family, our two families, meeting each other and talking and eating and my mother introducing people and making them feel comfortable. After the wedding, my wife and I made the three-hour trip to where my parents lived and just about every weekend all through that fall and winter until the following spring. She died on April 4th. Well, it was a couple of years after that we were having our first child, baby Ben. And that following spring when Mother's Day came around, he was five months old. Now, Mother's Day for me had never been the same. And yet, this was a special Mother's Day. It was going to be my wife's first Mother's Day, and it was Ben's first Mother's Day. And I was thinking about this a lot. Well, my wife went off to run some errands and take some time off. I was home with baby Ben, and he was a little cranky. So I lifted him up, and I had him on my shoulder, and I'm patting his back and trying to make him comfortable. And I'm thinking to myself, you know, here's this baby who is completely dependent on me, just a kind of lump of flesh here. Uh, he doesn't do anything for me. He can't do anything for himself. He, he can't even lift up his own head. And yet, I love this baby. I love this baby without reservation, without condition. I love this baby. And I realized that's how my mother loved me. And for the first time, I realized what that hug meant, and, and I cried out loud, Mom, I didn't understand. I'm sorry. I didn't understand. 
Well, baby Ben, <laughs> baby Ben is a college graduate. He lives in Brooklyn. He works in Manhattan. I don't see him very often, but when I do, you can be sure I give him a hug. And his little brother, Sam, Sam uh, just got a job. He'll be working for emergency medical services in Amsterdam. He's got his EMT and paramedic certification. He's living at home, so I see him just about every day. And yet, when I see him, I give him a hug. And their little sister, Anna, who was born on the same day my mother died, some years later. Anna is a student at SUNY Purchase, about three hours away. and. I see her maybe twice a semester, and when I do, you can be sure I give her a hug. And I wish there was some way I could tell you just exactly what that hug means, if I could find the words. But it's like I said at the beginning, it's easy to tell a story, but it's hard to tell a hug.